Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the hosts and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have a problem with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios East and West. This is episode 174 of Registry Matters. Larry, how are you this Saturday night? Fantastic. I am still alive despite someone's best efforts. Oh, best efforts. Uh, do you want to like take, I don't know, three, four, seven hours to tell us what has happened? Well, I, I was I was on the wrong end of a rearing collision. Well, I guess you, you're always on the wrong end of a rearing collision, but I was on the the receiving end of uh, some blunt force trauma with a vehicle that, as far as I can tell, didn't have tried to apply any braking on a four-lane arterial, and it was a very, very discombobulating, to say the least. I don't know the answer. I heard you talking just before pre-show with a friend of yours and about do anti-lock brakes, do they still leave skid marks? And I'm almost inclined to say no because the computer, as soon as it detects wheel slippage, it'll stop applying the brakes. I don't know the answer to that question, but I mean, uh, it, it's an interesting question. How would they then get out the little uh, thing with the wheel and they go track how long the skid marks are to figure out how, how fast they were going? I think they leave intermittent skids. I think that, that that they lock for just a brief second, and then there's like these notched locks, I think, so there would still be some evidence of a skid, but it's not the continuous skid that causes the person to swerve uh, a continuous skid. Yes. You, they, was, they used to teach you to steer into the skid, but nobody could do that. So the anti-lock brakes still lock, but they're, they're, they're like, uh, it's, it's, it's quickly locking and releasing. So there would be some yeah, evidence yeah, of yeah. a skid, but, but, I, but I, don't, I don't think he rate because the, the impact was significant as you could see from that picture I sent you. It was lovely. Yes, your car um, has a very big thing. And the other thing to note about that is your car doesn't have your the rear end doesn't have crumple mm -hmm. zone. So if you get dinged the way you got dinged, you got dinged pretty hard. Yeah, if the uh, if the if there had been any passengers in the back seat, I wonder if it would have done in, done them any good. Uh, yeah, who knows? Who knows? And then you also uh, kind of dinged your face a little bit too so i'm sure that you're even more attractive now than you used to be well the it was it was in a four on a four lane but the four lane had a lane closure which is what caused the accident the guy uh -huh. was not familiar with the lane closure and he was typically going to be driving in excess of the 45 mile an hour speed limit which people go 55 60 miles an hour down yeah. 98th street and what happened was he wasn't paying any attention, probably on his cell phone, doing the texting thing, you know, that, that that's the most efficient form of communication ever devised, rather than using voice. And he probably just did not see until it was too late when he had the impact, is what I'm guessing happened. But it was it was certainly an experience. This is the second time in my life uh, that I've had a rear end collision. They're they're wonderful. You should try one. Oh yeah. Oh no, I've I've I got dinged uh, twenty years ago. Actually twice, like twice a very Close distance apart, maybe a year apart, two different vehicles, two different states, and whatnot. But anywho, all right. So enough of that. Well, uh, I, well what? Well, well, I, I did, I did collide with the vehicle in front of me because of, uh, with the lane closure, it was stop and go traffic. So he pushed me into the vehicle. So I got the the impact from behind, and then I, I got the impact from hitting. So I did hit the steering wheel with my face and with my chin, and, and uh, it was not, it was not dramatic damage, but there was some damage, and it's very uncomfortable. Uh, there's a swollen lip, and there's there's issues all over my body because of it. Uh, but anyway, they didn't get rid of me. Damn it. God, it's like, I, I'm going to have to possibly put a stop payment on that check. All right. Well, <laughs> all right. Tell us what's going on tonight. Oh, we've got a discombobulated program tonight with uh, <laughs> se <true>. several, <laughs> several directions. We're going to be uh, reviewing some letters from mostly behind the walls of prison. And we've got some articles we haven't done articles for a while. Hopefully we can go through all of them. And then we have the George Floyd conviction and some observations and some old clips about criminal justice, the way elected officials were looking at it back in the 90s and the way those elected officials are looking at it today. And we have a Supreme Court, an important ruling, not necessarily on our issue, but in terms of explaining where the Supreme Court is and where they're likely to be for the foreseeable future in terms of criminal justice matters. Excellent. 
Uh, well, then let's uh, start with this. Uh, I think this came over Discord from one of our super longtime patrons, if I recall right. It's Mike. Uh, he's had a question for Larry. That's you. I've seen a lot of interviews where people are saying that people should be convicted without a trial. This was mainly interviews with people about the trial in Minnesota, of course. Do you think when people are talking about this, we're going down a very dangerous road, especially when a member of Congress is saying uh, nothing other than conviction on all counts is acceptable? I, I, I had just a ki tiny little uh, blurb to, to put in there after, when he posted this up there. I was like, of course we're going down a dangerous path that we are... You're, you're getting trial by fire in the media and whatnot, and you're guilty before you go anywhere, before you even like indicted, you're, you're almost convicted of this. And yes, why not? Why do we have the confrontation clause due process? Why is any of that even there? If, if uh, we can just convict somebody long before we go to trial. Well, that's the unfortunate thing about this particular trial in, in Minneapolis. There were so many already questionable decisions and then what he's talking about, Congressman Maxine Waters, about her comments. I wish she hadn't made the comments, and I said so, I think, even to you. But I've said yes, made that did. comment. I wish I wish that, that she hadn't have done that. The judge said the same thing. The presiding judge did. But I just hope that people, when they, when they feel that way, that they will also be aware that there was a whole lot more comments from the conservative side about what a travesty of justice this is and how that the police officer shouldn't have been charged and that all this is is dog and pony show to appease the angry mob and so forth. And so let's just be fair in our criticism. I have no problem saying I'm, I, I find what Congressman Waters said to be inappropriate, but she wasn't the only one. And, and there was plenty of rhetoric, some very, very harsh rhetoric coming from the, and still coming from the conservative side. But to the question about, uh, I'm all about due process. I'm concerned that the, a change of venue wasn't granted. I'm not sure that anybody believes that he got a fair trial in Hennepin County, Minnesota, with all the publicity. The question is, could he have gotten a fair trial anywhere in Minnesota? And you want, you want these people to get a fair trial. You want them to get a fair trial because you want the conviction to stand. You don't want it to be overturned. You don't want to risk the person being released on an appeal bond for some egregious error. You want the conviction to be solidly obtained where it will be withheld, up, upheld, not withheld, upheld on appeal. And a good prosecutor would want the very best trial that could be had. And I'm concerned about that mistake of, of not granting the change of venue. That will be one of the many appeal issues that will be raised by the defendant. He's not the defendant anymore, the, the convict. Right. Um, and do you have any opinion? I, I think we've talked about it. I'm curious to know what your opinion is of the range of sentencing that he could get, whether will they run them concurrent, consecutive? He has up to 40 years that he could serve. Do you have an opinion? The way I read the Minnesota uh, news accounts, and, and you take news accounts for accuracy for what they're worth, it seems like that that under Minnesota law that it all consolidates into the highest offense. So stacking them does not appear to be an option in Minnesota. So the 40 years looks like the top limit because that's what the, the the highest charge carries, and everything else would be subsumed into that 40 years. That's the way it looks like the news media has has covered it. I swear it was the uh, the two second degrees are up to 15 years. And then the other one has a maximum of, so if we did two 15s and then another 10, that's, that's my understanding. Could be totally wrong. That's just what I was kind of processing out of the whole thing. So, but, but I was understanding that the, 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 the harshest charge carried a, a 40 year max, huh. but, but, but anyway, the, the way I'm reading the accounts is we'll, we'll be corrected by a Minnesota listener. We've got, we've got several there, but, but the, the highest charge, the lower charges are subsumed into the higher charge and they can't stack them. Okay. All right. Um, I guess we will uh, jump on these letters from the peoples in the prisons and whatnot, right? Well, let's do it. All right. And I think you wanted me to skip down to where... Hey, I got a quick question or two. I'm under the old law pre-7 second legislation pre-September 96. Did I say that right? 72nd legislature. Okay. Uh, if I wasn't told about registration in court when I took probation 26 years ago, 
can they impose it after the fact? Also, I purchased a packet on how to legally remove yourself from the registry. It was pretty interesting. It basically told me that I could tell them I am moving out of state to remove me from the registry, then just never register anywhere else declaring myself homeless. This was info through the Safe Streets Foundation, and then they list the URL, uh, prisonsfoundation.org. Would like to know if it's legit, and if it is, just want to share. Anyway, guys, thanks. Sincerely. Have you ever heard of a packet like that? I have indeed, and let's do that question first for, yeah. for this person. Uh, you will find yourself serving a very long period of jail time if you follow that advice. Oh, so uh -oh. all so right. Here, so first of all, if you went in and told them you were moving out of state, they wouldn't just simply deregister you. What they would do is they would take as much information as, as you can provide them on where you're going, and they would notify that jurisdiction to expect you. That would also generate a, a report to the federal marshal service that looks for in, interstate movement of persons forced to register. So if you did not show up in the state where you told them you were going, that would the loop would not be closed. So the state that you were registering, it would still carry on its registry. You would be non-compliant. The state that you were moving to would never register you because you didn't show up. And the United States Marshal Services, with all the vast resources they have, would begin searching for you. Now, the part that I don't know the answer to conclusively is if they found you in the state that you never left, if they would have a federal jurisdictional hook, and I don't know that they would, but they've been expanding the federal jurisdictional hook with with some unfortunate bad decisions. But at the very minimum, I can guarantee you this, if you did not leave the state that you told them you were leaving, and you did not report in that state where you were, if you say you had a 90 day registration obligation, and you simply told them you were moving from, from that state to state B, and you didn't get yourself registered in state B, and then and then you, the marshals found you in state A, they would, at the very minimum, the state would prosecute you under its laws because you misrepresented the situation and you would find yourself in that state's prison system. But you possibly find yourself in a federal prison cell. So do not follow that advice unless you enjoy serving prison time. Jen in chat says she thinks she heard of someone in Florida get in trouble for saying they were moving and then not. That would be I'm not correct. Sure if the, the, maybe that's maybe that's a Florida thing, but I can see. No, the, no, the, it's the it, it it's it's file it's fa a false information. You're so, okay. You, you oh, true. Affirm okay, that you're giving you're giving you're giving them truthful information, and now if circumstances there could be circumstances that with your best of intentions could go go wrong and you don't move, but but when you go in and tell them you're moving, that starts a whole machinery of machinations procedures in okay. place and if you don't leave you're going to find yourself in a world of hurt go ahead and try that advice if you enjoy prison time <laughs> i see all right then um and then so there the was first, the other the question there yeah the first part as long as the state that you're in has continuously upheld the registry as being a civil regulatory scheme which in this particular writer's case is Texas, and that is exactly what they have done. They have not been able to prove that the Texas registry is punitive. They can impose a civil regulatory scheme on you, even though it didn't exist at the time. So the answer to that question is very sadly, yes. And what confuses people is they say, you can't have any ex post facto laws. You can have ex post facto laws as long as they're not that analysis only applies to criminal statutes. You can pass a civil action and you can apply it retroactively. That would be the case for pretty much everybody. They took their, their plea deal. They went to court, whatever, some X number of years ago before there was a registry in their state. And then they fire up the registry in that state and they, they drag you into it. And why is that the case, Larry? Well, because it's a civil regulatory scheme. <laughs> Right. Uh, I really hate that term, but I understand it well, significantly better with when you put it that way. Well, it, she she's on the right track. If 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 the registry has evolved in Texas and it can be proven to the satisfaction of Texas or federal courts, and I can tell you that the federal courts, Texas 
is in the Fifth Circuit, and the Fifth Circuit has proven itself to be very hostile towards towards any challenges related to registration. You can you can look at how they ruled in the city of Louisville case, uh, that where about 95% of Louisville was off limits, and they found that that was not unconstitutional. So in federal courts, you're not going to get a lot of traction. And state courts, Texas courts tend to be very conservative. So I do not imagine it's going to be easy to gain traction in Texas courts challenging this. So it's unfortunately, I wish I could give her wonderful news. She might want to consider when she gets out of prison, leaving that state. There might be states where that she could live with that really old offense and not have to register. And we don't analyze those cases here on, on registry matters, but there are there are states where that might be at the age of the of the offense, the conduct is so old, it might not trigger registration obligation. Very well. All right, then let's move over to the second letter from an individual. It says, I am currently incarcerated at SCI Mercer. I don't know where that is. South Carolina Institute Mercer, maybe? Is that fair? Nope, it's in Pennsylvania. That's State Correctional Institute. They name them that way, SCI and then the city. Oh, okay. Well, no one would ever know what that is. All right. I was recently shown your magazine and I was amazed by some of the articles that were in there. So I decided to, uh, to write to you myself. I am writing to you to ask for your help with this subject. I am a convicted sex offender, PFR, and I have been in the system for nearly six months now. When I was transferred here to Mercer from Camp Hill, uh, oh, when I was transferred, um, I have noticed a lot of things that I thought was wrong. Uh, here at Mercer, really have nothing here to better ourselves to make us better people once we get paroled. There is absolutely no school except for GED. There are no traders here like there is at other correctional facilities. Prior to the pandemic, there wasn't even tracks here. Is that what that says? I think so. The trades, prison staff. Trades. Trades. Does that say trades? All right, trades. The prison staff have no idea why either. So my question is. How are we supposed to better ourselves if they have nothing to help? Also, I have been speaking to several inmates who are close to being paroled, and their response is, this prison likes to give hits for no reason at all, especially if you're a sex offender. I truly feel that it is not fair or right for probation parole to do this, because if a person does everything that the prison DOC recommends and completes any and all classes and groups, then that person should be paroled at their minimum time. But in this prison, it's not that way. The parole board finds any little thing to keep a person behind bars. People are getting tired of the parole board's crap and may uh, and max out, which should not be, especially if the judge says parole at minimum. Could you help us bring awareness to the subject by printing this letter in your magazine? This would be a huge help. Larry, I can like personally attest to this one in my state where there were no programs and they dangled a roll in my face twice and like for no reason i never got in trouble i've always had a detail etc and somehow i still uh, made it all the way to the end of my sentence i really like this question because i get to do a little bit of explaining political realities and although i have a immense amount of sympathy for people who are in that position it demonstrates the total lack of understanding by most people about what all the things that state government does and all the competing things that are needing state funding. And prisons rank fairly low on most states' priorities when you look at all the things that state governments do. Because as a general rule, prisoners don't vote as a general rule. They're either not eligible or they, or they don't vote even if they are eligible while they're in prison. And when you go out on the campaign stump, when you say, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, if I'm elected to the state House of Representatives, I can assure you of this. We're going to have some of the best rehabilitation programs in the whole entire United States. We're going to pump money into it like we've never been, done before. Just vote for me. And I'd like to see a show of hands of how many people or just applause or something to signify how you feel about that. There would be no show of hands or no applause. Therefore, finding the funding with all the different things that the state has to do in Pennsylvania, they have to fund some level of education. And I don't know the split between state and, and local funding. I don't know enough about how Pennsylvania is governed, but they have roads to take care of. They have all sorts of obligations with, with, with education, with environment, 
with with you name it, they, the, the state government does it. There's things that you don't even understand. When I look at the state budget of our tiny state here, and I look at all the all the agencies of what's going on. I mean, they 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 run employment unemployment insurance. They have they have things to do with with workplace safety inspections. Uh, we have we just have on and on with agencies that you've never heard of that 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 do work, and they they are a little bit higher on the priority than prisons. Prisons, when they when they present their budgets, the 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 thing that gets the funding is security. We need staff. We need staff for security, and they start going down on the prioritization, and programming falls way down. And when you have to balance your budgets, which most states have to do, doing beyond the bare minimum of what you have to do to keep a prison constitutionally compliant is just not politically uh, feasible. Therefore, his issue is that there's just not funding for these programs, which means he's in a catch-22. The parole board's telling him, if you if you better yourself, we'll let you out at your minimum. And he can't better himself because there's nothing at that prison except for GED, which if he's already got his high school diploma, that's of no use. So he's in a yep. catch-22. I got to say, though, isn't this something of an investment? If uh, we pick a number, 40 grand a year, I know it varies, but 40 grand a year to incarcerate someone if they spend X thousand bucks to train someone and that helps them not return. Isn't that a uh, kick in the can down the road in a positive sense of uh, a return on investment? Or is that, am I just, am I not in reality zone? You're not in reality zone because that's, that's that liberal wishful thinking. You can't quantify those things. We can quantify right now how many people we've got in prison, how much security we need, how many staff positions we have. If we bring in a bureaucracy of rehabilitation services because they might not come back. That's all well and good, but they're here now. And I've got to fund them. I've got to feed them. I've got to do a medical care. I've got to keep the institution secure. And I've got to do all this stuff now with the funding I have. And when you go to the legislature and say, and by the way, you need to increase our budget by another 25% so we can do re rehabilitation so that we in the out years we'll have fewer people here that's a really tough sell. All right. Uh, then, let's see here. This one comes from... Is it, do you want, this is the Dear Assemblywoman Timberlake? That's not what you want, where we're going next, is it? That's the letter from the it's, next one, I think. No, it's it's the top page of that one. Uh, the, the, oh, oh, the, oh I'm too far up. down. I understand. I got you, I got you. I'm sorry, I scrolled down. Uh, it says, Dear Narsal, the New Jersey legislature is considering lowering the provision for uh, lowering the provisions of the no early release law, which calls for certain sentences to be served at 85% to be reduced to 65%. However, as is the usual case, PFRs are excluded while all others are included. Once again, it just shows you that the state still does not want to allow these offenders early release or reduction of sentence to be served. Where I am housed is a treatment facility for PFRs, yet others of more serious offense and who do not get, uh, who do not get as thorough uh, treatment as sex offenders can be considered for early, rele early release if the bill is approved. Many of us here have sent letters to our legislative representatives requesting that we be included for the new provisions. The discrimination of an offender class as usual only continues. I thought I would share this with your organization, not because I'm a member, but also because of the hard work you all do on our behalf. I hope the info is helpful. As always, thanks for all the work and the support, and rest assured you will always have my support. Sincerely. Well, this one, this one I like because, I mean, we all know that every time there's something that's reformed, that PFRs are largely excluded, either totally or significantly as in with the first step step act at the federal level new jersey is rather unique it's under democratic control but there are still republicans present in the state present in the state and those northeastern republicans tend to be a little more progressive believe it or not there's still some progressives left when you when you're on that northeast corridor there there used to be a very hotbed of liberal moderate republicans and there's still a few of them there. So if it were me and I were trying to f figure out a strategy, I would go 
to the Republicans and say, hey, you know, try to insert an amendment in this Democrat legislation because if we're really going to save money, we need to stop excluding so many people and see if you can get Republican buy-in. Then you've got the Democrat Party on the defensive if if they're trying to narrow the scope because they're pretending they want to save money. That, this is a cost containment measure. So you get to appeal to the Republicans to say, hey, here's an opportunity. We can save even more money. And I guarantee you, no Democrat's going to vilify them for wanting. I can't guarantee it, but I can almost assure you that no Democrat's going to vilify you. And let's try to save even more money by not having this blanket exclusion in here. That would be my strategy if I were in New Jersey to see if you could get some Republican support because it just might materialize. I mean, it wasn't that long ago they were governed by Chris Christie. And by comparing him to a Southern governor, he was pretty moderate. And you look at Hogan, which is not a Northeastern state in Maryland. He's fairly moderate. It, you, you can't get elected in these states if you're if you're like an Alabama Republican, you know, you, you something like that could never get elected in New Jer- in New Jersey. I mean, Kay, what's her name in, in Alabama? I forget her last name, but but uh, she she could never that. get elected. That's she, not Hutchins, is it? Well, you get the point. You know that that person yeah, yeah, couldn't yeah. be elected in New New, New Jersey. And, yeah, of course uh, not. Kay, Kay, Kay Ivy, Ivy, I think her name is. Yep. yep. Yes, that's what so, uh, Will says in the chat. Yes, Ivy and Jen too. Yep. Thank you. So yeah, but I would I would approach the Republicans and try. Now he's in a difficult position, being that he's in prison. But he is already writing letters. If you see, he wrote to an assembly person, uh, you know, yep. to Assemblywoman Brittany Timberlake. And uh, I would I would continue that effort. And I don't think it's completely without without logic. That's what I would do. Okay. Uh, do you do you think that people behind the walls writing to representatives has minimal anything any impact it would be it would be minimal but they have if you have enough people and you can make cogent arguments that letter's a little bit on the long side uh but if you can make cogent arguments succinctly i mean i do read the letters that come to this office uh, i can't say that the senator reads all of them but they do get read from prisoners okay. every single one of them get, get read uh, i go out of my way to make sure they get read and perhaps if something really is something special, then it gets passed along, perhaps? That's correct. Sure. All right. Uh, and then we will move on to the next one. And this is the one you're going to read because this one is special. This one, this one's number five, right? Yeah, this is, I happen to be the subject. God, I can't. This is, wow. Uh, hard to read. I, that's all I can say. Okay. This is, this is one I... I put it here because it goes to the notion of the truth will set you free. I happen to be subject to one. I'm going to laugh my way through this. All right, well, go ahead. Uh, It'll be great for the transcriptionist to figure out. Right, Will? Oh, good. I happen to be subject to one of the issues that your organization is looking to change. Specifically, I'm serving a lifetime special parole for a conviction of Iowa Code 709.4 essentially statutory rape. This is due to me picking up an underage minor in a bar who also happened to be drinking with her parents. When I found out her real age, I reported it to the police and basically got screwed. That was in 2008. I discharged Class C felony in 2015 and I was placed on lifetime parole. And since that time, I have been out of prison for maybe 16 months total. Now, that's not very much since 2015. (laughs) They have violated my parole three times on technical, uh, whatever he says, on technical violations violations, uh, that weren't criminal. I I am one of the violation police, even testified, I saved a woman's life when I intervened and physically subdued her boyfriend. Oh, he, phys- he, she, he physically subdued her boyfriend, uh, who was something. Stabbing her. Stabbing. Oh, crap. I was, I was, I was found to have uh, violated curfew, even though <laughs> it was my next door neighbor and sent back. Now, you have to admit that that's funny. That's that's terrible. He was next door at the neighbor's house, and then not. I, I've always like for real, Larry. Like 
when it says be home by your curfew, can you be in the backyard? Suppose you have like a 10 acre property. Can you be in the yard or do you have to be in front of the TV in the, on the couch? Like, uh, all right. A any more to that you want to read and then discuss or is that the end of it? Well, well, what we don't know is if he if he was already there being entertained or if he went there to render aid. See, the, the letter is not written in a way that we have that information. But even, even regardless, it doesn't take much to violate PFR supervision in, in most states. It's very rigid supervision. And the, the attorneys often don't tell them how rigid the supervision is going to be. And, and of course, if you're in prison, you don't care how rigid it's going to be because you want out of prison. But if you have, if you're negotiating a plea that might put you on probation without going to prison, the attorneys never tell you how bad it's going to be because you never would take the plea if you knew. But, but anyway, this is one of those I just put in there because the devil got into me. I wanted to people say that the <laughs> truth will set you free. If if this is an example of telling the truth setting you free, then I don't know what to say because if he self-disclosed what happened when he found that the girl was underage and then they locked him up for it. Uh, we could clearly say that the truth did not set him free. Well, legit, Larry, there's there's somebody in chat here tonight that I've had this conversation with, and, and he is a very religious person, and he wants to make sure that he is following his guidelines, and he wants to make sure that he's following probation, and he doesn't want to lie, and he is stuck between a rock and a hard place, that if you if you do step out of line, and then they go, hey, we need you to take this polygraph, and anything you say will be held against you, Th then you're forced to lie if you happen to be home at a curfew two minutes past when the curfew is done. You have to then lie convincingly, which is against your rules. Yep. So, but yeah, uh, I, I don't think we need to spend any more time on it, but no. the truth doesn't always set, set you free. All right. Ready to be a part of Registry Matters? Get links at registrymatters.co. If you need to be all discreet about it, contact them by email, registrymatterscast at gmail.com. You can call or text a ransom message to 747-227-4477. Want to support Registry Matters on a monthly basis? Head to patreon.com slash registrymatters. Not ready to become a patron? Give a five-star review at Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Or tell your buddies at your treatment class about the podcast. We want to send out a big heartfelt support for those on the registry. Keep fighting. Without you, we can't succeed. You make it possible. We uh, we will then bounce down to these clips and we will come back and circle around to articles. Is that is that fair by you? Sounds good. So we're gonna we're gonna do the clips with uh, with uh, starting with which one? Uh, the crucial reason, I think. All right. All right, let's do it. Do Over the past 26 hours, Americans have been taking in a rare occurrence in this nation. A police officer convicted of murder on the job. How rare? From 2005 to about 2015, a period including thousands of police killings. Believe your eyes as you look at the screen. The number of police officers convicted of murder for shooting a person over all of those years altogether was zero. I can report for you that from 2016 on, there were about one or two such convictions a year for police shooting deaths. And now, this year, we have the first such murder conviction of 2021, which is correctly seen as a rare development. Big front page news, a possible turning point. What do you have to say about that? I am not sure he's accurate about thousands of shootings. I think there might be a little hyperbole there, but I don't have the statistics either. But the point is, there have been an awful lot of police killings. They weren't all shootings. Some of them got uh, suffocated. Some of them got uh, a rough ride. Do you remember the one that, that got the rough ride that, that they end up dying? Yes. Yeah, they, 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 they're not all. I think that was. Yeah, they're not. They're not all police shootings. But what I'm setting up here is the the criminal justice reform that we all claim that we want to see happen and how we got to this position and what it's going to take to move us towards reform. So we've got a whole series of clips coming at you. But this one was so, this, this, this killing was so egregious that we actually got a conviction. 
but okay, let's so keep keep going. The um, the Minnesota Attorney General had an opinion. The prosecution team that led the case against Derek Chauvin has called the verdict a step toward justice. Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison spoke with 60 Minutes Scott Pelley for his first and only interview since Derek Chauvin's conviction. There was one question that has gone unanswered in the trial and in the jury verdict, a question that even the video couldn't answer. And that is the question of motive. Why? Why would this officer assault George Floyd? Well, that's a question we've spent a lot of time asking ourselves. And uh, all we could come up with is what we could divine from his body language and his demeanor. And what we saw is that the crowd was demanding that he get up and that he was staring right back at them defiantly. You don't tell me what to do. I do what I want to do. You people have no control over me. I'm going to show you. I also think that, you know, George Floyd was treated that way because he was, uh, he was suffering from anxiety and claustrophobia, cooperated with the police in every way until they tried to make him take his six foot four body and jam it into a very tight space in that car. And uh, he, he kind of freaked out. And I think the fact that he was not complying, he wasn't, I wouldn't call what he did resisting. I would call it he wasn't complying because he was having an emotional reaction to getting into that car. Even after he ended up on the other side of the car, he said thank you to them, and he would have been, but they just, I think what happened is, you do exactly what we tell you to do when we tell you to do it, no excuses, and it's, it's, it's really an exertion. What did you want to glean from that information of the Attorney General? Well, as, as he was saying, you can't know why a person does what they do. And unfortunately, you didn't need to know why he did it. You just had the evidence that he did what he did. Uh, he, he, he intentionally kept his knee on the person's neck until his life was extinguished. But it seems like to me that it was that the only thing I could agree with. I, I can only agree with the attorney general. That was the only thing his, he said. It was conveying to the people that were saying, let up was, you people don't tell us what to do. We're invincible. We don't answer to you. That's a sad day when the people that employ the police officers have no say over what the police officers do and how they do their job. That's I don't know how we got to that point, but apparently that's where the police departments think they are, that, that, they, that they get to write their own rules and do exactly what they want to do. And should the population step up and push back on what the rules are? Well, I don't know that I have the complete answer, but one thing I can say with certainty is that we should get over and beyond this notion that we don't control the police. I, I don't know of any other occupation where we tell the person, you get to make your own rules, you get to, to monitor yourself, you get to decide what equipment to use, you get to decide when to, when to deploy it, and you get to make all these decisions. I can't think of another occupation. They don't do that at NASA. They don't do it at the post office. They don't do it at the Pentagon. I can't think of anything where we let people decide how they do. Certainly the military, try try disobeying and find out what happens to you in the military. But in the police, uh, it seems like that do you get to decide what you want to do? And if you violate the, the policies that they have, there's very little in the way of repercussions. And that's what this whole thing is about is accountability. When you pull an old lady by her hair and you drag her across the street and it's proven you did that, you have to be held accountable. We don't want our police officers who we pay their salaries and their benefits dragging 67 year old ladies around by their hair. We don't want them doing that. That's not acceptable for our code of conduct. Just like when you're working in a supermarket, they don't allow you to grab the customers behind. They don't allow you to solicit phone numbers from the from the guest. They don't allow you to do a lot of things because it misrepresents their values. And and I don't understand what this is not a complicated issue, folks. The police work for us and we get to make all the rules. And so now we will move over to those individuals. 
This modern system grew out of a racist Jim Crow framework. It grew out of American policing that used a punitive crackdown on inner cities, which is measurably harsher than almost all other countries like the United States, like other democracies. And many of these more recent controversial and harsh approaches to crime, they were passed by both parties. In the 1990s, then-candidate Bill Clinton cast himself as tough on crime and made a point of flying home to oversee an execution. I'm just going home. You going to Arkansas? Yeah, we've got an execution tomorrow. And I always spend all day on those days uh, at the man. Are you saying that Bill Clinton goes home like waiting to press the button to to stop an execution? Is that what that clip's about? Well, I, I think that the the host took that out of context. I remember we we're talking about 1992, almost 30 years ago, and communications were a lot different in those days. But every state where the executions are used, they traditionally back in those days, had a hotline to the governor to see if there was going to be clemency because lawyers are always making a last minute appeal to the governor. And they also have a hotline to the court, the state Supreme Court to see if there's going to be any judicial reprieve. And to make this sound like that Governor Clinton was going home because he was ready to smoke a big fat cigar to celebrate an execution is ridiculous. That was not why he was going to Arkansas. He was going to Arkansas because he might be called upon to make a decision, and he wanted to be readily available to make that decision in 1992. And that's probably more likely the truth. But okay, <laughs> keep going. Next clip. Some of the most powerful Democrats in office today were there then, and they were for it, and they were touting how tough those policies would be. The plan is not as tough. It is fair. It will put police on the street and criminals in jail. If you want to do what our constituents are pleading with us to do, which is make the streets safe, tough laws on punishment, smart laws on prevention, you will vote for this. This bill would have put more police on the street, would have locked up violent offenders, would have given more prison construction money. It's a very well thought out crime bill. More cops, more prisons, more physical protection for the people. You must take back the streets. So that was, uh, that was uh, in the middle there, that was Chuck Schumer. And like, I, I could hear it in his voice, but boy, does he look very different today. But that was also, uh, I don't remember who it was. Was it Chuck Schumer at the beginning and then Hillary Clinton and then Joe Biden at the end? The whole, the whole uh, list you just articulated, that's where, but remember, that's where the people were in 92, 93, 94. The crime rate was higher and the people were demanding tough action. And that's where the people were back then. And the 100,000 additional officers was a big savings for the states because a lot of states misappropriated those funds or so they, they used it in lieu of there are officers that were supposed to add 100,000 additional officers because that would help fight the tidal wave of crime that we were, they were having back then. But the point I'm putting that out there for is that the Democratic Party was a part of the problem. You can also be a part of the solution. Now, when we go to the next clip, we're going to see how one party has evolved and has recognized that some of what they were supporting three decades ago was not good public policy. And we're going to see another party who has no intention of changing. So let's now go to clip three. More money for prisons. Biden was describing the call from then President Clinton. And they'd go on to tout that bill. Biden called it the Biden crime bill as recently as 2015. Now, today as president, Joe Biden is leading on a very different approach. And it can be a sign of strength to change your mind or change your plans when the results demand it. And where are we going with this more money for prisons and Biden? Well, that that's that Biden has had a change. He's recognized that what we were doing in the 90s needs to be adjusted. Now, the next clip will show you that the people on the other side of the aisle have not had that epiphany yet. So go ahead with the final clip. And offenders weren't just stuck in jails because of what they did. 
This is fundamental. It was because of also what politicians did. And some of those politicians are retired. Others are still in office. Some have responded to the failures of this system by embracing reform, what I talked about, the strength of being able to change your mind. Others are still doubling down on mass incarceration today. Many Republicans right now are trying to prevent even a debate and vote on this George Floyd bill in the Senate. It's the Mitch McConnell strategy for most things that are pushed by the other party. Just block it. While also, again, when I talk about complexity and evidence, also it's worth noting that there is at least one Republican senator now stepping out saying it's time to negotiate on some parts of the George Floyd Act with a veteran CBC leader. So is, is that the, the Republican Party is going to get on board with criminal justice reform stuff? Well, it sounded like one might, uh, but, but the point of it is, is uh, when you say you want reform, watch who is pushing for reform now and who is obstructing it. And as with the First Step Act, it was watered down by, I keep going back to the same thing over and over again for the regular listeners, a group of conservative senators led by Tom Cotton from Arkansas caused you not to get the full benefit of the First Step Act. It is a group of conservative senators, now less one apparently, that is trying <laughs> everything they can to prevent any meaningful criminal justice reform from happening. If you want the reform you say you're for, then you need to apply pressure to these Republicans. The Democrat Party has seen the light. But since the Senate is divided equally and it takes 60 votes to get anything done, that one isn't going to be enough. So we need to get some Republican support if you are for what you say you're for. Uh, okay. There, there's, a, there's a lot going on there with this, Larry. There, I mean, there's a mountain of stuff going on here with this, too. So, well, it's just, it's just, just not, not as simple. I, no, I, I know where you're going. It, it, we, we have one party that's on board, and we have one party that's not, and we only have the two parties pretty much to deal with other than a handful of outliers of independents like Bernie and whatnot, but Rand Paul. Uh, but yeah, a lot. there, there has to be a lot of uh, concessions made by... What do you do with a guy like Joe Manchin? Joe Manchin's in like the practically the reddest state, and he's a Democrat in the uh, in in West Virginia, where he may well, be for it, but he p might not be politically able to do it. Uh, well, Joe Manchin will be on board. Of, if it, I mean, he may not be on board with every single component, but he won't block criminal justice reform. Uh, he, you know, you'll, you'll get the Democratic caucus, but you, you're going to need sixty. It's not anything you can do with budget re reconciliation. So you're going to need right. sixty. So I'm telling you, since you've got one who's saying it's time to start negotiating. Find me nine more, and I'll help you get the job done. Because that I'll get one you is 50, also Mitch McConnell, you, who's the leader of the well, party. That, right, that's my whole point. Sure. If you're for what you say you're for, then you have elected an awful lot of people that are against what you say you're for. Gotcha. All right, I, that uh, that closes out all the uh, the fine clips for the evening with no technical difficulties whatsoever. Where do we go from here? Well, depending on how much time we have left, we can go back to some articles that we've been that we've been skipping. Okay, we I'd have like a... to I'd, li I'd certainly like to do the Supreme Court one because that okay. one that one's very important, and I'd like to pontificate about the shackling of pregnant women uh, for sure. Perfect. So let's do the Supreme Court upholds life sentence for teen killer. This is from Courthouse News. Uh, and there's a, another article in there as well. So I guess basically what the Supreme Court ruled is that juvenile defenders can be held accountable at adult level. I think that's how it went. Uh, not exactly. It's life without parole sentences. Um, the The Supreme Court at an earlier time in a case out of Alabama, Alabama had decided that life without parole was unconstitutional for juveniles. This Supreme Court in a 6-3 to three decision with all six of the conservatives in that majority, overturned that case and said that, that this Mississippi person who committed this crime at age 15 can be held as a sentence with life without parole, and that there ha does not have to be the specific finding that previous precedent had had uh, had required of incorrigible. So the reason I want to put it in here, it doesn't directly impact PFRs, but it indirectly does, because 
a lot of people, particular politically conservative people, are sitting around waiting for the Supreme Court to save us. And I have been trying to say, actually, when it comes to criminal justice stuff, the more conservative the court is, the less likely they are to save you from anything because they're going to defer to the states. So what this Supreme Court did in a 6-3 majority with a blistering dissent from Judge Sotomayor, that they said that the, the state of Mississippi can do exactly what it's doing without, without that uh, incorrigible, incorrigible finding. Ties back to the Ninth Circuit case with Stephen May, which we felt so bad about. He has a 75-year sentence. And one of his arguments was the excessive nature of that sentence. But that's within the sound purview of the state of Arizona and its elected officials that it has decided that that, that sentence is okay. If you're waiting for the Supreme Court to save you on harsh sentences, you're going to be waiting a very, very long time until we have a different court. So I suggest that you get serious about electing the right people who make the laws to begin with and communicating to them that you do not want these excessively harsh laws because a conservative court is going to defer to the states who made these laws, and they're not going to second guess the people of those states. So that was the reason why I put the articles in here, because there are so many people who believe the court's going to save them, in particular, a conservative court's going to save them. Yeah, I'm not really a fan of where this one went, and I heard about it. NPR covered it. That's where uh, I originally heard about them. Um, can you quickly describe what starry decisis is? Well, that's the the like Justice Scalia. We played a clip. It's it's where the existing precedent guides you in decision making, so you don't have to start from scratch and invent the wheel every time. And so this court basically jettisoned that that notion because they wanted a different outcome. This court wanted the state of Mississippi to be able to have the discretion to do what it did. But it's not going to stop at just death sentences, I mean, excuse me, life sentences for juveniles. It is going to be all challenges against the harshness of sentences. They have telegraphed to you loud and clear in a 6-3 majority that if you have an issue about the excessive nature of your sentence, that's not a problem for them. I'm trying. I'm trying very hard, Larry, to frame this that this, we should let the states determine because that's closer to the people. The people voted for the legislation and DAs and whatnot, and that's how this sentence would have come about. That otherwise, then we would have the Supreme Court be super le super legislators. Correct, and Justice Scalia would tell you that today. There's nothing that required the Mississippi to impose a life sentence without parole. They did that of their own volition. Justice Scalia, if he were alive today, would tell you that there's nothing in the Constitution that precludes that. Therefore, he's not going to invent something in the Constitution that's not there. If right. you want the life sentence to go away, Justice Scalia would tell you to go to Jackson and to convince the people in Jackson that you've elected that you do not want juveniles subject to life sentences. Do not come to him wearing a black robe and expect him to undo what you did to yourself. That's what he would say. Changing gears just for a second, Richard in chat asks if Stevens' attorneys have asked, have considered asking the governor for commutation. I swear, I think we covered that. They have. Uh, it was either, and, and like the governor's not going to do this because he probably wants to keep his job and would get voted out of office if he commuted the sentence of a PFR. They, they, they haven't considered that. They've, they've considered the Prosecution Integrity Unit in Maricopa County. They've considered everything. Uh, unfortunately, none of it's likely to work, but they, they, they have an amazing legal team. All right. Uh, then there was that one. You did, you wanted the shackling. We've covered this at least more than once, but um, this is from the Associated Press. Broad support for North Carolina bill to bar shackling of pregnant inmates. Yeah, like, how is it ever okay to shack? <laughs> how is it ever okay to shackle a woman that's pregnant? Well, because it's the policy of the department that all what happens is, uh, in most instances, in prisons they get transported to 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 do delivery. Now, some prisons do deliveries in in custody, but lots of times they're transported the smaller the institution, the county jail, or whatnot. But it's their policy, and we have officers who take their policies very seriously that all inmates are to be shackled when they're in the hospital. 
and they look at that black letter and they say, well, it says all prisoners are to be shackled. Therefore, you are a prisoner, right? <laughs> yep, that is correct. Now, what what really boggles my mind, and, and you've heard this before, why is it that we have to have a law to inspire you to rewrite your policy? Why wouldn't you just be able to, and I support the law, so don't misunderstand this. I support the law because you're not able to do that. But why wouldn't you be able to just say all prisoners as a general rule are to be shackled with some exceptions, and maybe since no one is capable of figuring out what those exceptions are, to articulate a few of them and then say this list is not all-inclusive and give the officer some discretion, which is what you claim you want. You hear officer discretion, officer discretion. We want officer discretion. Okay, well, give your officers some discretion, okay? If you really believe in officer discretion, that's what you hear police leadership saying when they defend the officer's action. They say, well, we have to allow them some discretion. Well, show us you really do mean that. There are there are at least two women in chat, and I, I suspect I know one of them has had kids. I don't, I'm pretty sure the other has kids also. But can you? I can't imagine carrying around a ten or fifteen pound bowling ball like in your abdomen, and you would be hostile to the point that like you couldn't really run away. I don't. I can't even understand the concept of shackling them. I suppose someone got irate and grabbed some. Uh, scalpel or something and started stabbing people and that's where this came from that's just a guess but I don't think that that's don't a common a, a common thing that women are doing when they happen to be giving birth while they're incarcerated I doubt it would happen that way I think it's just a holdover to a policy you know our policy it's like handcuffing you know they have a policy all prisoners will be handcuffed so you take a 90 year old man 90 year old woman 80 year old woman they've got very weak skin they've got all these issues they're so brittle their hands and it's like you say, okay, chief, I'm not going to handcuff this old lady. I'm sorry about your policy, but I'm not going to follow it. But you need to give those officers that discretion to make that decision. As I said earlier, you claim you believe in officer discretion. Give them some. We've covered that before. I, I, I'm just saying in chat, it's like it's silly slash funny to even bring it up just because it's it's one of those things that tips the scales of being ludicrous. We have something of, let's say we have five minutes left. Pick one more article before we, we drop out of here. If you're okay with that. Are you in pain? Oh, I am, but I can, I can make it through this. We've got, uh, we've got the Connecticut def uh, prison defending the porn ban, which, which is uh, in my claw. So let's do that one. All right. So this is uh, for also from Con uh, Courthouse News. Connecticut defends prison porn ban as boon to female staff. Uh, like so, it says conceding Monday that this case not an easy one to take. A lawyer for Connecticut prisoners unable to collect their Playboy subscriptions argued that the state has only anecdotal evidence that its pornography ban made prisons a less hostile place for female staff. I would almost argue, Larry, that if the men that are in prison had some sort of stimulation to relieve some stress, so to speak, that that might make life easier on the female guards. I, I, I don't know that that's true. It seems like it'd be true. So, well, this is an interesting one because you don't have unlimited rights to receive printed material when you're in prison because the prison administrators have a duty and a responsibility to keep the institution safe for the residents as well as the staff. And therefore, they, they can put place restrictions on inappropriate content. Now, how they determine that this creates an issue for the staff, I'm not concerned about it offending anyone. That That is the least of my concern, and I don't have any hesitation saying that. If you're going to work in a men's prison, male or female, whatever, makes no difference, or if you're somewhere between those two, I don't care that you're offended by what you see in terms of what, what, what the men are looking at. I do care about how the men conduct themselves when they're interacting with any staff member, and we would not want anybody to be escalated because of receiving porn. But I, I'm not aware of any evidence, and I think that's what this case is about. I'm not aware of any evidence that, that supports the notion that just because you have a Playboy, if they still publish those, that somehow or another that you're going to be escalated and aroused to the point that you can't be appropriate to a female officer. I don't know that there's any evidence for that. Otherwise, I would say let them have the magazines you want 
the prison rape elimination project is something that I take seriously. You want these guys, these urges, they do need outlets. And I don't see, it seems like to me that, that porn would be one outlet so that those urges would be less less obvious. Maybe I'm missing something here. We'll wait to see what people say. But uh, I'm not a big fan of, more, of, of banning adult magazines from prisons. I uh, agree. Maybe you could make it to you know excessive degree because you can get some pretty hardcore ones that do exist. Maybe those get uh, not allowed, but I don't know. I, I have read plenty of articles from places like Men's Health and whatnot that the plumbing for a male is very important to keep healthy. And assuming that these gentlemen want to get out of prison or that they're going to get out of prison and they want to have functioning junk on the other side of their, their prison sentence. I, I, it just see, it seems uh, inhumane and unhealthy to then kind of keep everything locked up, so to speak. Uh, can you be more specific? Functioning junk. I'm not familiar, <laughs> not familiar with that. Well, you'll re- you'll know the term from the TSA. It's like, don't touch my junk, man. Right? So you could use that metaphor. I know we're being silly and playing fun with this. Uh, I, I totally know. And I'm, and I'm going along. But yeah, so uh, touching male genitalia. Like, we want functioning male genitalia on the other side of this. There. Okay, was that, so uh, that's what, was that PC? That's, that's what functioning junk is. All right, I've got it. <laughs> All right, Larry, I think that we, <laughs> we are done with no technical difficulties on the evening. I didn't say it at the beginning, but make sure that you press like, subscribe, all that stuff on YouTube and miscellaneous other places. I guess like Spotify and Stitcher are the only places that you can like podcasts. But uh, that, that's the best way to find them anyways on a podcast app. But uh, otherwise, you can find all the show notes and everything over at registrymatters.co, phone calls. Oh, wait, I, Larry, we got, I, we got a patron. We got a patron. I got to go get that information super quick. Hold tight, hold tight. I know, it's funny that he made me be Pacific about it. We had a patron. Ah, it's being slow. I'm running, I'm running over my hotspot, Larry, so it's going slow. Because I didn't want my internet to, uh, to crap out. Uh, we got a, we got wish, a new I wish you, pa- I, I you wish you people would fix your internet. I wish you people would fix your internet. It's supposed to be happening. I talked to tech support uh, Thursday night, and they said that uh, they're doing, quote unquote, a node split. And so hopefully that'll resolve everything. But uh, we did get a new patron named Sean. Sean, thank you so very much. Uh, and uh, very much appreciate your generosity. And otherwise, Larry, that's all I got. You can find everything over at registrymatters.co. And with that, Larry, I bid you adieu. And I hope you feel better and recover uh, efficiently. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, man. Good night. Bye. You've been listening to FYP.